Good afternoon or morning, everyone, and welcome to our first uh, iteration of the Hazardous Weather Testbed Experimental Warning Program Satellite and Radar Convective Applications Experiment. I am Elisa Bates from the Weather Warning Decision Training Division, and with us today we have um, six forecasters from all across the country, and they will be telling you about the experimental products that, and so, some experimental and some operational products that they've that they have used this week, and. Uh, now I will turn it over to one of the principal investigators on this project. He is a, a University of Oklahoma SIM scientist uh, who works with the, on, with the SBC. So go ahead, Michael Bolin. All right. Thank you, Elisa. So first, just as we get started here, just a little, little blip about the experimental warning program. I'm sure um, a lot of you are probably familiar with it um, by now, but our mission is uh, really focusing on that warning scale and improving helping to improve the prediction of severe convective weather events on the warning scale. So we um, operate in a real-time environment, utilizing um, real weather from across um, the country throughout the week, and try to get the forecasters into a, a sense of warning mode as, as realistic as possible, and how they can use these experimental and um, some operational products to um, better enhance their warning decision-making process. And being located um, here in Norman, we're um, surrounded by a large community of researchers, as well as operational meteorologists, um, students, and other industry that um, allow us to um, put on this research here. And we consider this a vital component of the research operations process, as well as getting um, feedback from, uh, from operations and operations to research to uh, further um, enhance these products before they go into operations. So for this week, we operated um, mainly across the uh, southern plains, um, deep in the heart of Texas throughout most of the week. Um, Monday, we started off um, in the Lubbock and Midlands area, kind of in a spin-up and training day. Um, Tuesday was a pretty good severe weather outbreak across Oklahoma, as well as southwest Missouri and the Springfield, Tulsa, and Norman offices. Um, and then Wednesday and Thursday, we uh, stayed mainly in the central and south central Texas across San Angelo, Fort Worth and the Austin-San Antonio forecast areas. So first up, we have our um, single radar azimuthal shear uh, product. Stephen Cobb will be talking about it from the Tulsa, Oklahoma forecast office. And just one quick note that the rest of our uh, presenters will be talking about events that have ha happened this week. But in this case, uh, we will be talking about an archived event from March 3rd, 2019, and will be in the southeastern U.S. Okay, good morning everybody. This is uh, looking at the single radar azimuthal shear product uh, from Maxwell, Alabama, actually, in far southeastern Alabama. Uh, on the left side of the screen is the azimuthal shear product, uh, bright uh, red and blue, and, and then the bright white indicating the circulation or the uh, potential circulation. Reflectivity and velocity, of course, are on the right there. What I saw, first of all, and I think most forecasters uh, recognize with this, is the, how, how easily it is to identify circulations uh, within uh, the uh, overall uh, convective cluster, or in this case, convective line or QLCS potential. Uh, so it does have potential even to highlight or give you some lead time uh, for the developing circulation, which is especially critical in QLCS situations, of course, where minutes matter. Also, you can see along the trailing part of that line to the southwest, of the radar where uh, you have increasing convergence. So uh, you can also identify fairly easily the surging of that line or bowing of the line, which again is an important uh, feature before uh, the, the mesovortex uh, develops. So this is actually a sequence of three images showing the evolution of this particular one. In this first image, the uh, circulation is, is pretty weak, but yet it really sticks out and has mutual shear of what's important and where to investigate further. Uh, going forward here, you can see the it's circulation increasing and how the uh, mutual shear product is it, it can easily follow that circulation and its development over time. So with any product, uh, looking at radar, of course, you have to be uh, concerned with or, or mindful of the viewing angle of the radar. So here's a, a look at two different storms, the top one, uh, with the storm is to the east of uh, the radar, still relatively close, and you can see that the um, convergence signature is fairly strong, but that mutual shear uh, is, is not that great. So uh, this viewing angle here doesn't provide the best look at this particular uh, potential circulation or development. From another radar, um, it may be more apparent, and 
We also looked at merged uh, azimuthal shear and uh, from multi-radars. You can see that in that case, it, uh, you would overcome this limitation of this single radar. Uh, the bottom picture here shows, uh, the bottom image shows the uh, a different storm at a different time uh, to the south of the radar where you had better uh, sampling and uh, better relative um, sense of the circulation. And you can see that azimuthal shear certainly does uh, stick out there and should show that circulation very prominently. Again, some easy takeaways here. As Azimuthal shear from single radar does have potential increased lead time, especially in those situations where minutes matter, QLCSs for instance. Also, I, I think in low-top supercell cases where maybe you're not anticipating uh, these spin-ups uh, as, as, um, e as easily uh, to occur maybe in a, another situation, uh, the azimuthal shear could definitely help with that. Also, radar viewing angle and other things with uh, single radars could be overcome with a dual or a multi-radar uh, product uh, that we looked at uh, throughout this week. Uh, I think also can aid in detecting and tracking uh, storms uh, when they're uh, oriented unfavorably with the single radar. Thank you, Steve. Next up, we will be talking about the NOAA Unique Combined Atmospheric Processing System, or NUCAPS. And to do that, we have Shane Egan from Rapid City, South Dakota. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so just a quick overview of NUCAPS. Currently, we get uh, the unmodified NUCAPS soundings in AWIPS, and I was using the modified which soundings, which essentially takes the RTMA mesoanalysis surface data and attempts to modify the soundings to more accurately represent the boundary layer, what's happening. And we found, at least I found, that they did quite a good job of doing so. So here is an overlay. One of the things we recommend uh, is overlaying kind of your satellite with the new caps. All the new caps locations are these dots, and you get a better sense of the green dots are the ones that passed all the QC checks, and the uh, yellow dots and the red dots as some are all, or failed, some are all. Um, so we're comparing this storm complex west of Dallas, Fort Worth. The home here is the Fort Worth office launched an 18Z sounding, and I pulled a new cap sounding from this point, kind of downstream of the convective environment. So here you see the 18Z Fort Worth sounding, and this is the 19Z, so they're not exactly the same time, but uh, when I first pulled up the modified new cap sounding, I was quite floored by how well it compared and immediately thought of all the potential utility it would have in an operational environment. Uh, the Cape values are pretty similar between the two and it corresponded well with the SVC mesoanalysis fields as well. Um, so really just the key takeaways of what I really want to highlight is how this is another useful mesoanalysis tool Especially, like I said, we only get the, we don't get the modified new cap soundings in AWIPS. You'd have to do that yourself. Um, but they can be highly useful, especially in the absence of a special balloon, if you don't want to use model soundings, which I found on this day were often too moist over too deep of a layer. Um, and one final thing is you can pull up the soundings and put on the pop-up SKU-T and hover over each sounding and get a general idea of what each profile looks like. So it's relatively useful. Thank you. And now we'll have another new CAPS example. This will be using the new CAPS forecast product. And to present it, we have Jacob Bird from the WFO in Juneau, Alaska. All right. So there's a bunch of different ways you can kind of look at the new CAPS forecast. And um, what that is, is it's trying to give you a layer of uh, some of the different fields. So for my example, I just overlaid the Cape field. Um, and I tried to put some satellite uh, underneath of it just to see kind of where the, the holes were in the data. One thing to note is um, that you have your option when you load an image in AWIPS is to have interpolate on or off. And, you know, personally, I, I like smoothed out images a lot. Um, but you can see how drastically the data gets reduced if you try and use the interpolate versus, you know, what, what you actually have available. Um, so kind of highlighting the two differences, and I would say from a field perspective, you're going to want to keep the interpolation off if you're trying to be, uh, use one of these new caps forecasts. Um, so I also had some ideas for, you know, ways to load this data and uh, 
fill in some of the, the holes. Uh, one is to use like the All Sky, uh, All Sky Lab product. Um, that, that would take care of it for the Kate field where it's available. And um, the other would be to just, you know, keep a model field possibly underneath. Or even just uh, where we're missing just small holes, um, kind of interpolating in between them, just so that we have a, a, a product that's um, trying to fill in some of the, the data gaps. Um, our area of interest was in Texas this day. So we had a fair amount of good data, but um, it did leave some to be desired with the direction these storms were moving. Um, so that, that's kind of my takeaways. I covered it with the uh, arrow there. All right. Thank you very much. And next up, we will have a duo of forecasters talking about a variety of products, including All Sky New Caps and the version 2 of, props, of the probability of severe or prob severe product. First up, we will have Eugene Brusky from WFO Green Bay, Wisconsin, and he will be followed by Chris Jacob from WFO Wichita, Kansas. Okay, hello, this is Gene. Um, what I'm showing in this animation is basically the All Sky Cape product. Uh, this is uh, animated approximately uh, every uh, 30 minutes and overlaid on there uh, a, a radar image. What uh, we just wanted to show was how some of the gridded All Sky and New Caps data, what it could provide in terms of insight into the downstream environment. One of the you know, questions you might be faced with is, is that convection going to persist? Will it intensify? What might be the threat uh, as a convection moves into the, uh, the forecast area uh, from the late morning into the early afternoon. So you can see in this uh, All Sky K product, it did a very nice job of showing the gradient of where the best instability is in the yellows and reds. And you can see how that instability is drifting northward and uh, intensifying somewhat. And you kind of get a feel that as the convection approaches that area, uh, it had a better potential for uh, maintaining itself and perhaps increasing in intensity. Um, this is actually a toggle. What we're looking on this first pane uh, is the uh, All Sky Service 900 precipitable water. Uh, the, the dark uh, blues and purples, um, are where the higher moisture is located at lower levels, you can see some more uh, light browns to the, to the north there. Um, and then as we toggle, uh, this is really the upper level of PW, 700 to 300. So it gives you a sense of the vertical moisture distribution, something you may not get uh, from the three water vapor band, ABI bands, and GO16 that you have in AWIPS now. So it gives you a little bit better feel of that moisture dis distribution. In this case, you kind of get a feel of uh, convective instability. We have the low level moisture, especially to the south, and that drier uh, layer uh, loft. One of the things that, that this helped us in our situational awareness was maybe the potential for wind would be greater uh, in this particular evolving uh, quasi-linear system. This is another, uh, kind of looking at the same type of uh, fields uh, in the left, and in this case is the new caps, 700 to 500 lapse rates. This is uh, from Polar Orbiter. Uh, the dots are basically the, uh, the locations of the soundings, and uh, as was described earlier, the green dots are reliable, sound, uh, reliable profiles, uh, where the reds are, are the least reliable. Uh, but what I wanted to show here is that although the new caps lapse rate uh, data on the left is kind of modeled, it looks a little noisy, it still provided useful information. And first of all, where there are clouds, you can see how the uh, lapse rates were, were, were lower, much lower, the environment was worked over there, it captured that well. And downstream, which is the area we were concerned in, the lapse rates were, were uh, considerably uh, greater, around seven to seven and a half. And if, on the right is just the RAP 700 to 500 lapse rates, just to compare the two, both valid at about the same time, 19 UTC. And they actually compared quite well. Uh, with, uh, in the sampling there, uh, values uh, in the new caps is around seven, while uh, from the RAP it was around seven and a half. So it gave me confidence that the new caps lapse rate analysis uh, was, was reliable, and it did provide insight into what the uh, potential for maintenance of that convection uh, would be. All right, this is uh, Chris Jacob uh, from the Wichita office. Our mesal analysis using all sky and new caps, uh, like Gene mentioned, showed an area favorable for a uh, damaging wind potential. We wanted to look at a uh, prob severe version two 
just to see what those probabilities were like for these individual storms. Are they increasing or decreasing as they're moving towards that area of higher instability? And this is what happened later on uh, as the storms tracked across the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They moved into the southern portion, which was into that area that had higher instability, looking at the all-sky uh, Cape instability map. And one of the important things that really helped us is these uh, time series graphs. It, the blue line represents uh, wind prop damaging wind probabilities, which actually spiked up to a little over 80% at the time. And looking at the graph on the far right, you can see the lightning gradually, lightning flash rates gradually increasing following the green line. And then the yellow line represents lightning jumps associated with this activity. So it did intensify as it moved into that area of higher instability. Some of the key takeaways, all sky and NU caps gridded data provided insight to downstream environment and potential for convective maintenance and threat. NU caps gridded data lapse rates were also very comparable to the RAP analysis. Prob Severe version 2 has great built-in diagnostics. It's good for using cell trends to look at those of time series online. And it also provides confidence in the warning decision process for quick diagnosis of increasing or decreasing storm intensity from those time series graphs. Thank you very much for those uh, briefings. So last but lot not least, we are we will be talking about the geostationary lightning mapper or GLM products. And for that we have Michael Charnick from the WFO in Grand Junction, Colorado. All right, so uh, one of the things we got to look at this week uh, was a variety of new GLM products that we don't currently see in AWEPS. Uh, right now, most of the field is familiar with using flash extent density. That's what you see on the top left of this four panel right here. Uh, the other three images are event density, average flash area, and total optical energy. Uh, these are the three that I think amongst the group we found to be fairly useful out of the new suite of products. Uh, event density uh, takes a little bit closer look at uh, the actual events that make up the flashes in GLM. Uh, and one thing that we noticed here, this is a case of a supercell, a splitting supercell in central Texas. Um, you can actually notice a second core of higher lightning activity as this, as this cell spreads out and the splitter moves off to the north and the east. Uh, that signal is a little bit more muted in some of the flash extent density products that we're used to seeing. So this could be, uh, this has some implications for use in storm intensification, possible storm splits. Uh, sort of high resolution data uh, that you need to see that. Uh, over here we have average flash area. Uh, this has potential use again for storm intensification and weakening. Uh, usually when you have a developing thunderstorm, your lightning activity, uh, the, uh, the lightning, the total lightning values, the lightning is shorter uh, in length. So you have a smaller average flash area right near the core of those thunderstorms. Um, and as the thunderstorm spreads out, the anvil spreads out and weakens, you get uh, sort of longer flash events here. And what you're actually seeing is that average flash area increase as the thunderstorm uh, grows and ages. So not really sure right now what the applications of this could be, but uh, it definitely seems like there's some potential with this product. Uh, and finally, over here, we have total optical energy. Uh, this uh, product has a lot of uh, potential uses in initial stages of thunderstorm development. Um, where the updraft has a lot of optical detection from the satellite. You can really see that thunderstorm develop well. Uh, another thing that we found over the course of the week is that layering uh, reflectivity on a GLM image is useful, uh, especially if you're only masking out uh, sort of the lower reflectivities and keeping the cores displayed. This sort of allows you to see what the core is doing as the lightning data is evolving as well. So it's sort of a kind of a best practice uh, that we've taken away from this week as well. This is another instance, uh, a different supercell later in the day. Uh, this is just showing the event density uh, as well as Earth Network's cloud to ground strikes. Uh, so in this case, you see a strong thunderstorm develop. Uh, the event density really uh, picks up in intensity. Uh, but you see something interesting happen right around here when that cell uh, finally is done splitting and it starts to right move and dive to the south, uh, the cell reaches its peak intensity and right at that point you also lose some of the uh, event density lightning signal. So something we 
We're introduced to this week is the fact that optical extinction could play a role in GLM data. Uh, even though there's a lot of strikes still showing up here on the Earth Network's ground uh, detection, the total lightning from the satellite actually decreases, uh, which is kind of as an odd signal. So this has some impacts possibly for storm intensity, uh, signals like that down the road. So some takeaways. Flash extent density is more descriptive. Uh, when cells split, you can see double peak signatures early in the data. Average flash area could have a use in uh, core formation of thunderstorms uh, and other uh, possible uh, impacts there. GLM event density was more informative uh, at times than other GLM data forms for this supercell. Um, intense deep updraft cores may result in some optical extinction, as we saw with the second example. And event density values decrease around when the storm peaks in strength uh, due to that optical extinction. And I'll just make one note. Um, we were looking at some cases outside of the planes, too, just in sort of areas that the convection was not in, as intense. And some of these trends were also noted. So offices out west that aren't getting big supercells, don't worry, we're looking at you, too. And uh, the lightning data is definitely useful out there as well. That's it. All right, so uh, if you're looking for more information on the EWP or the um, happenings this week and in the uh, coming weeks and uh, also previous weeks, you can visit the website there, um, as well as the blog, which um, can give you lots of, lots of examples that we, that we saw throughout the week and in the weeks to come. So thank you. Thank you all for that great presentation. Now we will um, open the floor to questions. So I will start us off with a question. Michael, could you speculate on how forecasters could handle the sort of noisiness of the, um, the GLM product when it came to the optical extinction? It looked like it was kind of pulsing up and down. Could you uh, speculate on how we, that might best be handled? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think just knowledge that that is something that can happen with very intense updraft cores is the first step in being able to interpret that data. Just having an understanding that when you see a very tall, deep thunderstorm, the case that you saw there was, I mean, that storm was at 50 dBZ up in the like 55,000 foot range. It was a huge thunderstorm. So you'll see that with cases like that and just sort of tune your brain to thinking, okay, if I have a thunderstorm like this, maybe I can look for this signal and, and anticipate that I might see it. And then if my observations meet my expectations, then I can take that and use it um, in the warning process. For weaker convection, uh, especially stuff in the Rockies and further west, didn't really see signals like that with the deep intense cores. Obviously, they're not um, having the same effect there. So I think to answer your question, just overall awareness of it and maybe some training on um, you know, how lightning evolves in a thunderstorm would be good to have. And Lisa, I think too, uh, having it paired with our ground-based network can help yes. uh, as well, because that can answer a lot of the questions that, that uh, you may have. Good explanation, guys. Thank you. Brian Mata asked, uh, what what decisions were made with the new CAPS profiles? I'm not sure to what he's referring. Really, what I was getting at is that it's sometimes a better alternative than model soundings. Uh, in this case, we hadn't observed soundings, so it didn't really add anything other than just kind of confirm that if you get a high quality sounding that passes a QC and new caps, it can be of value. Uh, in that case, if, you know, given that the environment was pretty well known and we had monster cape across much of the area, uh, probably wouldn't have added a whole lot, but it's maybe more marginal events or rapidly evolving events, I can see where that could. Um, I guess, if anything, it just gave me even more confidence that probably a uh, big hail day, but otherwise. So there was one other application that we thought of that we could be used for, um, and that's in, in Western offices where you have IMETs out in the field in remote locations where you're not getting a lot of quality observed sounding data. Um, I know I was clicking around in Western Colorado a bit, and the modified sounding, it seemed reasonable with how we know the boundary layer behaves in the sounding, and the modified seemed to uh, represent what you would expect in the atmosphere. So it may have some application and use uh, for either fire weather forecasting or spots or stuff like that down the road in very sparse rural areas. Yeah, 
two uh, applications just to kind of expand on that. It's really good at filling in your, your network of upper air. We're seeing some value in the, you know, the soundings they produce. So if you have 100 miles in between your upper air site or, you know, even further than that, um, it can really help to fill in that data network. Um, not, not to mention also, you know, 18Z soundings aren't super common, uh, relatively speaking, and this, this is going to come over during the early afternoon hours and kind of fill in that network for you. All right. Thanks for that great discussion. Um, then David Cuff is wondering, um, he says that if he recalls the, um, the NPP new caps data went offline last month. So are you using new caps from NOAA 20 or is NPP data available again? It's the NOAA 20. It's from NOAA 20. Yes. Okay. One more just came in from Brian Mata. Uh, how well did the GLM guesstimate the lightning data versus the ground-based lightning and ABI imagery? Uh, the trends seem to be fairly consistent between the two. Um, like we mentioned, that, that sort of uh, optical extinction effect was the one time when the data didn't match up very well. I haven't really looked at, you know, total counts. I don't think we had a any time to do that this week. Um, Different. It, it's two different things because you're trying to yeah. compare like a grid with a designated you know, kind of strike location almost if you're using the ground network. We were looking at one case with Prop Severe, which uses ENI as its lightning indicator or lightning input. Uh, GLM actually showed the old uptick in the lightning activity with this cell. Uh, prior to the prop severe showing the increased trend in, um, in, in its uh, output. So in that case, uh, I would say like a GLM was a little bit ahead of the ground-based networks, but I also saw several cases where the ground-based networks, especially in the developing convection, would, would have a, a lightning flash, cloud flash, prior to the GLM uh, showing it. Maybe just by, you know, a, a minute or two, but still the, the ground-based network for the head. I think one of the takeaways to note, too, about GLM is that the data, obviously, is different than ground-based network. You're looking at optical data from space. So while it may look similar, at least the gridded version of the ground-based network may look similar to what you're seeing as far as pixels on a, on a planar map, you're seeing two different types of data. So GLM provides value in seeing the aerial extent of the lightning in the cloud itself. It's area data. It's not point data necessarily, like a, a ground-based cloud-to-ground or in-flash uh, data. So you can you could glean some information out of the GLM as far as like maybe regions that might be susceptible to a CG strike behind a storm um, in sort of that long flash region. So there are some benefits to both, and we always recommend having them both layered, like we said, at the same time. All right, thank you very much again for that discussion. With that, we will call it a webinar. I'd like to thank all of our forecasters for taking the time and energy last night to put this, this presentation together. And thanks, Michael, for, um, for everything you do for that, um, for that experiment. And you all have a great afternoon.